Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. Today we'll talk with portfolio manager Jeff Mullenkamp, a man after my own heart. In the mailbag today, kind of a light one, just a couple of quick questions, and one of my least favorite topics, the Federal Reserve. And remember, you can call our listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. For my opening rant this week, it's all about sticking it to the man, but boy, do I wish I was the man. (laughs) That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sticking it to the man feels good, I think, but... Sometimes, sometimes it doesn't go the way you think it'll go. And what I'm talking about are all these people who are still buying and holding and promoting meme stocks, especially AMC Entertainment. They act like they are some part of a social movement, right? Because they be- these stocks became meme stocks because... They were heavily shorted. They're terrible businesses. They're going out of business. AMC, GameStop, Bed Bath & Beyond, they're going out of business. So they're heavily shorted. But, you know, given the times, especially in early 2021 when this stuff started, well, you know, people were still home from work. They They were locked down or, you know, many of them still were. And they had checks from the government and they were trading stocks and they got a little out of hand and they inadvertently caused an enormous short squeeze in the meme stocks. That's how the meme stocks became meme stocks. They were heavily shorted and they were squeezed by all these retail traders um, at home. So they think they're going to keep doing this. They, they think they've learned how to create short squeezes, and they have this hashtag on Twitter, M-O-A-S-S, the mother of all short squeezes is what they're always trying to do. But they're really just looking in a rearview mirror. They're not going to do it anymore. Or if they do, it'll be very, it'll have a short life the way the Bed Bath & Beyond squeeze went recently. You know, up 500% and then boom, back down, almost to where it was um, b- before they started. So... The reason why I'm just I'm just really skeptical of all this. They think they're sticking it to the man. And the man was a hedge fund called Melvin Capital, which is out of business. They were shorting, uh, I think they were shorting GameStop and AMC, maybe. They were shorting one or two of the big meme stocks. And they lost a whole ton of money and they wound up going out of business. And and Citadel, this big hedge fund firm, which is also it's also a market maker. They have this company called Citadel Securities, and they make markets in stocks. In fact, they handle more retail order flow than any other market making firm. So sure, maybe the Citadel hedge fund lost a little bit of money shorting you know, these meme stocks, but Citadel Securities loves this because they're handling all the order flow. So if you know, there's a big billionaire named Ken Griffin behind all this. I think he's worth like 20, 25 billion, something like that. <laughs> and he's loving this. So if you think that you're sticking it to the man by being long AMC or GameStop, you're not. Ken Griffin is saying, man, I love being the man. I love having it stuck to me to the tune of billions of dollars. And of course, last year, Citadel Securities did record revenue, more than $7 billion. <laughs> And as long as they trade these things, you better believe Citadel's going to be handling the order flow. They pay for it. These market-making firms pay for retail order flow because they make so much more money on it than they do handling institutional order flow. Because, you know, what if the the institutions, that they're doing research. You know, they sort of know, a lot of them know what they're doing sometimes. So do you really want to handle some gigantic order um, from some institution where they're shorting the stock maybe, and then it goes down. And as a market maker, you're sitting there holding a big loss all of a sudden. No, you want to handle retail order flow. 
right? They're they're twitchy and they don't pay attention and they do things that they shouldn't do at exactly the wrong time and they're constantly going back and forth. And there is just a great way for a market maker to make money. I don't know how else to put it. So this idea, you know, that that they're sticking it to the man, it's just it's not just wrong, it's exactly backwards. And once again, I promise you if there were a real bottom in sight, if this is the big bear market that I think it is, I think we're at the beginning of a pretty big bear market. Of course, I don't know. You don't get to know that until after the fact, right? But you should prepare yourself for that. And and if I'm right about that, I promise you, like, nobody will be talking about sticking it to the van by buying AMC and GameStop if this thing were really, truly bottoming. So. Maybe, you know, people say, well, it's a new bull market now, Dan. Well, okay, sure, Wh- whatever you say, but I don't think so. I su- or rather, my real view is I suspect not, and you should prepare for that. I suspect this is not a new bull market and that it's still a bear market and that the market is doing what it does, especially in bear markets, which is acting to lure in the maximum number of folks and and kind of treat them very badly, right? That's what, that's what the market does. And it's especially what it does during bear markets. And I just, uh, this, this, I covered this idea in my re- most recent Stansberry Digest. And it's, as you can tell, it annoys the hell out of me. I don't know why. Actually, I, I, maybe I do know why. I was driving down the street. I live in a rural area. I, we're five hours drive from any major city. And I'm driving down this country road and I see this dirty white van of some kind in front of me. And on the back of it, sort of scrawled in the dirt is, it says, buy hashtag AMC, hashtag AMC. I thought, man, you can't escape this. They're like scribbling stuff on the side of, you know, trucks and buildings and things like they're some kind of Banana Republic revolutionaries. You know, they're taking over. It's for the people. No, the people are making Ken Griffin rich. (laughs) That's what they're doing. You know, and I suspect like uh, most of the world's revolutionaries throughout history have thought they were doing something righteous, but they were probably serving someone just like Ken Griffin. Uh, Unfortunately, I think that's mostly true. I think the American Revolution was highly unusual At, at any rate. Um, I, I just wanted to talk about that. The other thing that I talked about that I think you also won't see at a market bottom was, you know, all this crazy artwork that I've written about and talked about over the past couple of years. And the craziest one of all was the banana tape to the wall at the Art Basel show. I think it was in 2019, actually. It's already been three years, maybe. Uh, and And, you know, this artist, Maurizio Catalan, he tapes a banana to the wall and he called the work comedian, right? Because bananas, comedians, slipping on a banana peel, you get it, right? And he got, he sold, I think, three copies of this where he basically gave the person, and they paid like a total of $390,000 for three copies of this. And he, the people who bought it, they get a certificate of authenticity and instructions on how to install the banana at the right angle and the right height from the floor. It's insane, right? Rich people in art. God, you know, it's crazy. Um, But I I took it all as a sign of continuing speculative froth. And I think it's, you know, money is just sloshing around the markets. It overflows into the art market and, you know, it gets crazy. Well, the crazy thing now is that a guy is suing this artist Catalan for the money that he made for the $390,000. And the guy who's suing them is a California artist named Joe Morford. And Morford says that Catalan plagiarized his work because 20 years earlier, he taped a banana and an orange to the wall. And I forget what he called his, his artwork. But a a judge in Florida, uh, because the, the, um, you know, Catalan's piece was on the wall in at an art exhibit in Florida. So that's where the case is going to be. A judge in Florida has let this thing go forward. 
right? Catalan tried to have it dismissed. The judge said, no, no, <laughs> we're going to go forward with this. And you can read, you can type Morford versus Catalan, C-A-T-T-E-L-A-N, and you'll, you'll go right to the document that this judge um, wrote up. And he's talking about, you know, bananas and art and all this stuff. But he quickly gets to, he quotes a guy named Marshall McLuhan. If you know who he is, great. If not, you can Google him, Marshall McLuhan. And McLuhan said, art is anything you can get away with. And as soon as I read that phrase, I was like, oh, that's it. We have been in an anything you can get away with market. And the meme stocks are that. And the people who are really getting away with something, I mean, the market makers, they're just doing business, right? And the retail people are throwing their money at them. But the one who's getting away with it is AMC Entertainment Management because they took their share count from like roughly 100 million to 500 million and sold into all this insanity. Basically, they heavily diluted their highly enthusiastic ignoramus shareholders, the worst investors on earth. So management is taking advantage of them and exploiting them and sold you know, roughly 400 million shares. And then they did something else. They created a whole new class of security. Like you can't just endlessly issue shares. Corporations have limits to the number of shares. And if you want to get the limit raised, you have to, the shareholders have to approve it. Well, the shareholders wouldn't approve it. And they ran out, of, they're running out of shares to sell. They can only sell like another 7 million. So they created this whole other class of securities, AMC did, called apes which is hilarious because that's what their shareholders call themselves, apes. And so they created this ape. It trades under the ticker symbol APE. And it's effectively, it's supposed to be one one hundredth of a preferred share, but it's effectively just the common stock. It's like nearly identical to AMC common stock. So they, they issued one share for every share outstanding. So they've effectively split their stock. All right. But what what I think is going to happen is that the shareholders are going to not like the fact that they can't convert the thing into common stock. So they're probably going to pressure the management to do that. So then instead of having 520 odd million shares out, they're going to have like a billion shares outstanding. Um, And they will have, you know, effectively diluted their. Well, that won't be the moment of dilution. Right. That's effectively a split. But the moment of dilution will come because if you read all the documents that AMC put out, they can issue as many as 5 billion of these apes. And they've only issued like 500 million. So they got another 4.5 billion. And if they can sell those, I mean, talk about exploiting your ignoramus shareholders. I, I I don't know if they'll be able to do it. I think this creation of these ape securities that are, you know, they're as worthless as the common stock. I mean, the bonds all trade at less than 90 and some of them trade less than 80. You know, they're, they're, they can't borrow the money, so they have to issue this other garbage. But I think they're actually done. You know, they created a big liquid market by issuing these apes. So, you know, presumably they could sell even more of them for cash. I don't think they're going to be able to do it. It's a money losing business. The only way they can stay in business is to issue new securities. I don't think they're going to be able to do it. And I think it's like, I think this is the beginning of the end of AMC. I can be wrong. I'm not making a prediction because I just think predictions are kind of futile. But that's what I'm on about this week, right? It's it's the anything you can get away with market. And the poor shareholders think it's like, the opposite. They think they're the ones who are in charge, and they're not. You don't have any of this stuff near the bottom of, of a bear market. People are going to forget all, you know, the, the meme stocks are going to be a distant memory. People are going to hate the stock market. People are going to leave the stock market and not come back for a generation at a real bear market bottom. And I think, I suspect this is a real bear market. That's what I'm on about this week. I'll leave it right there. I'm really looking forward to talking to Jeff Mullenkamp. So let's go ahead and do it right now. Look, I think you know by now, I'm always trying to tell you the really hard truths, 
even when, especially when, what I have to say is unpopular. Today, the hard truth is that your wealth is in danger. Everything you may have made in the bull market of the last decade could disappear very quickly. Some of it's probably gone already. This process has already started, and even if the financial markets somehow avoid a devastating crash from here, inflation is still eating 8% of your money every year. I've spent 20 years helping people prepare for extreme market shifts, just like the one we're going through right now in my role at Stansberry Research. I've recommended 24 triple-digit winners, and I called the collapse of Lehman Brothers with near-perfect timing. Well, today I'm issuing my biggest warning ever. If you want to preserve your retirement and your lifestyle in the coming years, you need to act. I recently went on camera to lay out a simple one-step plan for what to do. You can set yourself up in minutes and likely forget about inflation, rising prices, or the worst effects of a market crash for years to come. This plan does not involve options, shorting, crypto, or anything complicated, and it doesn't require perfect timing. The perfect time to act is right now, and you could see triple-digit upside in the coming years. To watch my full interview with the brilliant financial journalist and hard asset expert, Daniela Cambone, simply go to www.crashprotection2022.com. Again, that's www.crashprotection2022.com to watch our full interview for free. Time for our interview once again. Today's guest is Jeff Mullenkamp. Jeff Mullenkamp is the lead portfolio manager at Mullenkamp and Company, Inc. Mullenkamp Fund's objective is to maximize the total return to its shareholders through capital appreciation and income from dividends and interest. Before joining Mullenkamp and Company as an investment analyst, Jeff served in the United States Army for 20 years, retiring in 2008 at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Jeff is also a graduate of the Air Assault Airborne Ranger Schools and the Command and General Staff College. Cool. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Dan. Looking forward to the conversation. So, Jeff, I I am actually familiar with the Mullenkamp name. I remember years and years ago, um, and, and it's been so long that I can't remember if we actually spoke, if I actually spoke with Ron or if we exchanged some emails or something, but I was reading his stuff and I really liked the ideas. So when your name was presented to me, I thought, yeah, I remember that guy, but that's your father, is it not? That's correct. Ron is the founder of the firm. He brought it out in, boy, 1977 Wow! and brought the mutual fund out in 1984. Um, I'm sorry, 1988. Uh, I remember that year. I was one of the the first investors in the fund, and I borrowed money to do it. So the way it worked at the time, I could get a cheap car loan because I was going to the military academy and they knew what my uh, employment prospects looked like. So I took out a loan, bought a super cheap used car, and invested in the fund with the remaining money. And so that's that's how I got started in investing. <laughs> that's kind of a neat story. I didn't know you could do that with a car loan. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, unsecured, right? So right. it was, it was, it was. Uh, the car was not collateral. I see. There you go. All on the up and up. <laughs> oh yeah, it was completely legal. <laughs> yes. So I think a good place for us to start would be um, where I often start with folks in your in your business. Like if you and I met at a bar and I said, you know, what what kind of an investor are you, Jeff? If you know you're in this business, what what kind of an investor are you? How how might you answer me? Um, I would say I'm looking for value that other people don't recognize, right? So, uh, one of the things I do in my, my spare time is I ride motorcycles and I typically buy used motorcycles and, you know, what you can do is by paying attention to the market, you can get a feel for what a particular model and a particular brand, uh, is worth and and is generally selling for. So when one comes up, you know, on Craigslist or, or in the classified someplace, you can go and look at it and you have an idea what the market is. And if, if you can get it cheaper than that, that's kind of what I do uh, 
uh, not only buying and selling motorcycles, but buying and selling stocks, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm looking for uh, something that, that is not highly regarded, or at least I think there's more to the company than is baked into the price. So I'm looking for that mismatch between what I think the reality is and the perception that the market has as reflected in its share price. That's really what I do. Okay. So that sounds like a very sort of, you know, one security at a time, bottom up process. Correct. And and so Ron developed a model when he first started the business early in the seventies, he, he started uh, working for a, an insurance company called Inagon. And his model looks at return on shareholder equity and the multiple that the market will place on that depending on what the rate of inflation is at the time. So those are the two key inputs for his model. And we use that as a screening tool to this day. So we go through a, a, a universe of about 2,500 stocks on a quarterly basis. And, and we're looking for things that pop on his model where you've got a better ROE than his model gives for a value of that company. And that starts us down the path of investigating the company and figuring out the ins and outs of it and and if it's, is it a good investment? Oh, so ROE is a, is a central metric in the model. Correct. Uh, and the reason he settled on ROE is because it was more stable at the time than earnings or some of the other metrics that, might, that you might use. Oh, I see. Yeah. I'm just curious about it because we, we use a particular model in, in the newsletter that I write um, each month with another fellow named Mike Barrett. And uh, Mike runs, runs a model that's more or less discounted cash flow type. It's not exactly that. But um, then the thing that I contributed years ago before Mike ever showed up was a screen. And my favored return metric was return on equity um, simply because I, I wanted companies with decent balance sheets that still earn good return on equity because you can, you know, you can crank up the return on equity by borrowing a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I'm, I'm always, you know, when I find a kindred spirit, I'm always sort of happy about it. Well, the, the challenge we've run into lately is that companies aren't necessarily borrowing a lot of money, but if they've bought back a lot of shares, mm. their equity uh, per share has gone down. Mm-hmm. And so we end up having to kind of adjust for that. Right, because it, it really doesn't say that the company is more profitable. It really means that they've they've reduced the shareholder equity through buybacks. Um, so that's that's something that's kind of developed in the last you know ten fifteen years as it becomes much more popular to buy back your shares. Right, and a lot of them have have borrowed so in some cases quite heavily to do that. Right, some have. Yeah. Right, some of them look at their capital stack and say, okay, well, we can get cheap, we can get cheap debt. Why wouldn't we replace expensive equity with cheap debt? Uh, And, you know, if your cash flows are stable through a business cycle, that may be a rational decision. The risk you run, of course, is that your cash flows are less stable than you expected. And so you've made your company very fragile to a downturn by, you know, going for debt as a source of capital instead of equity. And and we want to be mindful of that. We want to be very careful of those sorts of companies and be mindful of where you're at sort of in the credit cycle. If you're going to invest in a company like that, you have to understand that's the risk you're running. You, you know, Jeff, as you talk about debt as a source of risk, I'm thinking, boy, the, um, this is just sort of normal thinking to a lot of us. But over the past, uh, you know, call it 10 or 20 years, you know, it's become sort of weird. What are you talking about? Kind of, you know, we're in the minority now, aren't we thinking that way? Yeah. You know, I couldn't really say if, if we're in the minority or not, uh, but it's the only way that makes sense to me. Right. And uh, my thinking on that was kind of reinforced, if you will, you know, by reading Nassim Taleb's books about anti-fragility mm. uh, and skin in the game and those sorts of things. But when he talks about, you know, being fragile, to me, as a company, the the easiest way to be fragile is to be heavily indebted, right? Yeah. So um, that's just kind of how that that translated to me. Yeah. So yeah, a whole lot of people were were very fond of debt, and and that's kind of scary. And and not just in the investment community, but you know, when I talk to my neighbors and I see what they do, kind of in their personal lives, mm. you know, they can have a, a just a a very lucrative career. They can be generating a lot of income. Mm but they've levered themselves up so much they really are not in a, in a stable situation or something to happen. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it's 
people do it in their economic lives in many, many ways. Indeed. You're, and you're, you know, in every case, whether it's corporation or your neighbor or anybody, you're just straining to pull forward, you know, your future income, right. And, and use all the benefits of the future income in the present. And it, uh, I don't know. It it turns out actually we, we should we should be honest here. It turns out just fine until one day it becomes a disaster, right? That is correct. Yeah. You know, as in your personal life, you know, if if you're uh, if you financed a big house, if you financed a fancy car, if you're financing your your vacations and you're covering all that with your very robust income stream, that all works great until the day you lose that income stream. Uh, so you can be you can be cruising right along, feeling good, living the life you want to live. Uh, but if something unexpected happens, you know maybe it's it's your health, maybe some accident occurred, uh, maybe you know something happened to the business that you were a part of that you couldn't anticipate or or didn't anticipate. But that's when you've got no cushion and your debtors are still coming for you, and, and you've got no income. Um, so, and it's the same with the companies, right? It, it all works great right up until the moment when it doesn't, and, and they've got no flexibility. They've got no, uh, resources to tap because the markets aren't there for them anymore. Again, I just feel like to a very modern sensibility, we sound like a couple old fuddy duddies. Don't you kids get yourselves in debt. <laughs> You're going to regret it. <laughs> You know? <laughs> well, they just haven't learned that lesson uh, through life yet. <laughs> right, right. And, and you know, it's funny that we're talking about debt because we, we kind of didn't plan it. We're winging this conversation and we didn't get together beforehand. But, we, you know, right now the president is talking about forgiving student loans. And here we are talking about your kids got your shells in debt. You know, it's just. And, and frankly, you know, we, we did our, our children a disservice. Uh, uh, full disclosure, both of my daughters are, are recent graduates of college. One's been out for three years and one's been out for a couple of months. But, you know, to, to encourage everybody to, to go to college is one thing, but to not kind of walk them through the nuts and bolts of, of what it's costing them if they're borrowing to do it, you know, that's kind of a disservice. And, and that, that, you know, we've made in order to make those loans attractive to the lender, we can't, you can't discharge uh, student loans in bankruptcy, so so that's that's a painful sort of debt uh, that that I think the kids get themselves into too easily. They they buy the sales pitch, um, a lick on us for collectively uh, of our generation for making that sales pitch to them, and and a lick on them. I mean, they're all bright kids, right? They're all going to college. They're not stupid, uh, but they bought the sales pitch. And then have buyer's remorse afterwards. Yeah. And there's also another thing that we've generated there in education are the bubble dynamics, right? The cost went way up. You can get a degree in just about anything you can name, you know, it's just. Right. Um, right. You know, we, we encourage them to get a degree and, the, and to pursue their dream. And so they, they go get something that doesn't translate directly into a, a lucrative job. Uh, a lick on us for selling them that fairy tale and a lick on them for, for believing in it. Yeah. So, you know, there's two, two partners in that dance. Yeah. And it, <clears throat> and just like all bubbles, it all looks so rational in the beginning. Well, of course you want a college education. And of course we should encourage everyone to do that. And of course it's a good idea to, you know, help everyone pay for it as much as we possibly can. And then, you know, here we are. And now it's time to count the cost. Yep. So I feel like we've, we're in philosophical territory here. Let's get a little more specific. Um, <laughs> are there, as you go through your bottom up process and, 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 um, refer to your model, you know, to suggest securities, uh, are there, um, are you agnostic about, um, sectors and various industries. Some people I know av avoid like commodity businesses. Um, some old fuddy duddies like us might avoid technology businesses still. Um, do, do you have anything like any constraints like that that you follow? Well, we don't have constraints, but you've got to understand the business, right? So commodity businesses are, are a good example or, or businesses that are very sensitive to the economic cycle, right? they end up being different. So so when you look at the returns on equity, the returns are going to be very good at the peak of the cycle. But that's absolute. And so the from our model's perspective, 
the stock is going to look very good. And it's going to look like it's worth a lot more than the market price because the market is looking at, you know, a cyclically adjusted sort of an ROE, uh, which we have to understand that and we have to do the same. But, you know, frankly, for for cyclical companies, the better way to really buy them is probably to look at a price to book. So there are any number of companies that, you know, uh, home builders, for instance, right? Typically in a home building trough, which we're entering right now, they're going to sell for less than one times book. And that's when you want to buy them. You want to buy them in the trough of the cycle. And then later on at the peak of the cycle, they're going to be selling at two or two and a half times book. And that's when you want to sell them. Uh, but from a strictly ROE perspective, they're going to look much more attractive at the peak than they do at the trough. So you've got to understand, you can't just take the model and, and apply it without thinking further. You have to understand what's going on in the industry. You have to understand kind of how that operates over time. And then you have to apply that knowledge to, to what you started with. If that makes sense. Oh, sure. So, cycle dynamics. Cycles happen. You better be mindful of them. Yeah. And in, in some industries more than others, you know, in healthcare, that's not so true. Right. right. Uh, in tech, you know, depending on the aspect of technology, uh, that may not be true, right? Whether your your uh, company is consumer oriented or it's business oriented or it's software and it's kind of agnostic to what happens in the cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, banking is a little bit different uh, in and of itself also, right? Mm -hmm. There you got to kind of worry about the credit cycle and what's going on with, you know, how uh, solid their book is and what the charge offs look like. Um, so you have to understand what's happening in the industry, what's mm -hmm. happening to the company. Um, but, yeah, where we start still still is ROE. OK, so this is, you know, as we've established, this is a bottom up one security at a time kind of a process. But as I look through your um, your July 2022 quarterly letter there's a lot this is a lot of macro discussion there's a couple reasons for that yeah uh, the first is it's really i have a hard time talking individual stocks and the reason is because i'm kind of constrained in how i talk about it right mm -hmm. so if i tell you that i like a stock because of of the constraints around my position. What I'm really telling you is I bought it some time ago and I own it today. Mm. And if I sell it tomorrow, I'm not going to tell you. So you might suspect that I am simply talking it up so I can sell it to you. In which case, there's no point in me telling you about the stock because you mistrust what I'm saying and you're right to do so. Right. Right. And if I tell you I like a stock, but I don't own it, then you're going to say, well, he's telling me he likes it, but he doesn't own it. Why the disconnect? So, Whatever I say about a stock, whether I own it or not, you as a skeptical listener should be saying, well, I, you know, I, I don't quite trust what he's saying. So there's kind of no point in me talking about it because I have to talk my book and you know I'm talking my book. And so you don't believe that I'm being honest and to a certain extent I can't be, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't really like talking stocks. Uh, so what does that leave you with? That leaves you kind of with talking about more general conclusions about sectors. That leaves you talking about with the economy and what's going on with the economy uh, and broader issues than that. And sometimes those broader issues are important. You know, there are long periods of time where they don't matter. Yep. And then there are some periods of time, and the last one really was 08, 09, when nothing but those broader issues matters. Jeff, I'm so, going to can, can go I just interrupt I'm sorry, for one? Yeah. I'm just going to interrupt. Absolutely. Yeah, just for one second. Our listeners know me, and they they're just meeting you. And what you just said, I've said probably twenty times, and I know they're sitting there nodding their heads, saying, "That's what Dan says." So uh, about you know macro does it. It's like macro doesn't matter until it's all that matters. I think is one of what right. I said. Yeah. So go on. Uh, and, Thank you. And, 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 you know, my formative experience in the industry was in 08, 09. I started working in the company in October of 2008. Wow. And the first six months was extremely painful. And the next three years or four years or five years or, or 10 years, you know, I've reflected on what did I learn during that time period and how did I kind of, you know, respond to it then and, and all that, you know, so you think about what was going on at the time, what I did at the time, what I thought about at the time. 
and those sorts of things. Um, but this is kind of what I've come to believe currently. I mean, you've got to, to do my job well. You're always looking for what don't I understand very well? What do I need to understand better? What can I learn from what's going on and from what just happened, right? You, you've got to really continue to learn. And that's what I try to do. The reason I wrote in that last quarterly letter about so many macro issues is because there are a couple that I think really are important. And the most important one, in my opinion, for our U.S. investors is to understand that if we are in a long-term inflationary environment, then the relationship between stocks and bonds has now changed. Mm. And what you've believed for the last 30 years, that bonds are a safe place to put your money and to protect it from the volatility of the stock market is no longer true, right? Right. Because in a, in a rising interest rate environment, bonds are going to hurt you, not help you. And so all these portfolios, the 60-40 portfolio construction that worked so well over the last 40 years, which has been a bond bull market, it's not going to be true going forward. And you need to know that. The sooner you recognize that, the better you're going to be. Now, that's predicated on the idea that we, in fact, have a period of higher inflation going forward, which I suspect is likely, but I'm not saying is certain. Sure. Yeah. Right. But there's a very... There's a very, you know, the the underlying assumption, when I look out at at the U.S. investor and I say, what assumption does he hold that might get him burned over the next decade? That assumption is bonds are safe. Right. Yep. Right. I won't lose money in bonds. And and I would simply say, be careful with that. Uh, to a certain extent, I agree, right? If, if what you're looking to do is to protect the nominal value of your investment over a short period of time, and by short, I mean two or three years, and you put into, you know, into a two or three year treasury, you are going to get 100% back exactly true. So, so they're safe from that perspective. But if you expect to invest in bonds for the next 10 or 20 years with the idea of growing your capital, I think you're going to be disappointed. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's uh, it's sort of the end of the world as we've known it. We had a bond bull market. It looks like it's probably over, and you had better be careful from here. So, you said something about uh, you know ongoing inflation, and 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 again, you sounded like me again. You you almost I almost thought you were going to say you should prepare for these things, not try to predict them. And I've said prepare, don't predict a million times. So. How, if you agree with that, how do we, like, what, how do we use all this, this insight? If we're aware of these things, what do we, what do we do then? How do you build your portfolio differently then from this point forward? Well, what is, what has worked really for the last 10 years, what has been most highly um, sought after or rewarded by, by the market players has been revenue growth. I think that's done. I think that really ended last summer when you started to see biotech collapse and then uh, the no-profit tech collapsed. I think we're probably halfway through that collapse. Um, so if you're th- so the first thing I would say is if you're thinking about bottom fishing in that, in that space, uh, I would suggest patience. My guess is from top to bottom is going to take something like two years. And you say, Jeff, why do you say that? Oh, gee, because I look at 2000, 2002, and it took about two years, right? So I see a similar kind of a bubble. I see a similar kind of a collapse. Uh, you don't need to be in a hurry. The values you see today, I suspect, will be there or maybe even better a year or two. So that would be the first kind of practical advice I would suggest to you. Um, I suspect as the cost of capital goes up, that companies that don't need to tap capital markets to do what they want to do are going to be more highly regarded than they have been for the last decade. So, you know, companies that are generating sufficient cash flow to maintain their existing operations and to expand as they choose to do, I think are going to be uh, more respected by the market than they have the last 10 years. And that's kind of the space we've always operated in anyway. That's That's been more attractive to us uh, than the folks that don't generate that kind of cash flow. But, and, and you've kind of seen that 
for about, and it's been on and off, but for about six or nine months, you've kind of seen that those kind of companies are doing a little better. Um, when you start to think about, you know, what if we have a decade of inflation? What if we have something that, that sort of kind of looks like the 70s? Right, where you have high inflation and the Fed does some things and it pulls back a little bit, and then the Fed eases up and then reflation reoccurs. Right, so you've got this ongoing back and forth um, between trying to to slow down inflation and inflation breaking back out. You kind of have that sort of thing happening for over a period of years. You know, where do you where do you want to be? What what we saw worked best in the 70s were commodities, right? So energy did reasonably well in the 70s. Um, Ron and I have had some some long discussions. You know, he he invested through that. So I said, Ron, you know what what worked for you then? And he said, Man, I wish I'd owned more energy. And we've we so we've looked at that, right? And you'll see that reflected in the portfolios. We own more energy now than we have for quite a while. But the struggle is, you know, when I read guys like Ray Dalio, and he makes a ton of sense, he thinks basically because of our debt, we're going to have to devalue the dollar. I, th- I think I, I summarized that pretty well. And you say, okay, well, where do I go? Where do I, what do I buy when I sell my dollar that's going to protect me from this devaluation of the dollar? You know, do I buy yen? Do I buy euro? Do I buy renminbi? Do I buy gold? What? Where do I go? And as I started looking around at all these places, frankly, the yen scares me more. The euro scares me a whole lot more, especially now. Um, I don't trust the renminbi because I don't trust their government at all. Uh, we made a statement. I made a statement about, I guess, 18 months ago that, in my opinion, Chinese equities are uninvestable. Uh, and I can explain that if you want. But I think everybody is in the same boat. We're all looking for what's going to provide stability in an environment where most of the Western governments have to devalue their currencies. And so far, I don't think we've settled on anything. When we do, then kind of everybody will know. Um Right. So, I mean, gold kind of isn't big enough. Right. It's very small. Sure. But it's Dalio, very small. You, you mentioned Dalio and, and he's been on um, for, I want to say a year or two now. He's been on a, you must be diversified kick. You know, mm-hmm. that's been his mantra through all of this. And I'm not saying he's wrong. Yeah. But, and, and I'm not quite sure either what diversified translates to as a practical matter. You know, what does that really mean? Does that mean you need to own debt? Does that mean you need to own foreign? And if so, where? Again, be, because I, you know, I started looking. I said, okay, well, you know, what what do Japanese companies look like? Are they interesting? Am I willing to take the risk uh, of the currency translation that is inherent in investing in Japanese companies, for instance, or in European companies, for instance, or Chinese companies, for instance? And and the you know, you go back to Buffett and his, his thoughts about diversification, you know, the less you know, the more you want to be diversified. So really add those two together. And what Ray Dalio is saying is, I don't know, own a little bit of everything and what works will beat what doesn't work. That is not necessarily bad advice. <laughs> exactly. And it, it actually um, makes me think about another thing that I saw in your quarterly letter, which I, I tend to think the way asset classes correlate nowadays just up and down together so often i f- tend to feel oftentimes like the only true diversifier is cash and i note you did you did say in your quarterly letter that you're holding a fair bit of cash and that certainly helps diversify one does it not yes it does yeah. um ideally through diversification you would want to find something that goes up when everything else goes down but if you can't do that, then owning something that goes nowhere when everything else goes down yeah, is a good second best. Uh, cash, to me, cash does a couple of things. One, you know, what I learned uh, going back to 08, 09 is just kind of how I personally react to a really crappy beer market, right? So I get very, it's hard for me to look at 
stocks and I feel bad. Everything's going down. Everything I own is going down. The last thing I want to do is go buy a stock. And yet, that is exactly the time when I should be looking for the bargains and looking to put money to work. So having cash on hand allows me to focus on where sh- where is the opportunity for this cash instead of obsessing over, oh my God, my stock is down three or four or five percent today. Right. So it's as much it's it's very much a mental thing. Right. It helps me focus, you know, how I'm thinking because you know, you're trying to make good decisions in a very uh, kind of chaotic environment. And so what I learned coming out of there is is, you know, my emotional and physical reaction to a down market is a key indicator of how I should be thinking. How I should be thinking is where's the opportunity today? Cash allows me to take advantage of that opportunity because I don't have to think about what do I sell today in order to buy today. It becomes one decision. Where do I invest my money today? And I don't have to think about selling into a really crappy environment for selling. Right. And you're also, um, you're, you're at least alluding to this idea that Seth Klarman discusses of the, uh, you know, the future opportunity set. When you're, when you're in cash, if you trust yourself to find a great opportunity, you, you've effectively found it even before you know what it is, right? Because you've got the cash ready to exploit it. Right. So, yeah, we are, we are heavy cash right now. Uh, frankly, I expect an opportunity to put that cash to work uh, is ahead of us, right? I, th- I think we're going to see better prices ahead of us uh, than we see today. Why do I think that? You know, really, it simply comes down to the Fed is still raising rates. And I, I struggle to see how the market really goes up in that environment. So the Fed has yet to start shrinking its balance sheet very much. So, you know, credit remains widely available both through the banks and then the non-bank lenders, uh, but the cost of that debt is going up. So, you know, as long as that continues, and, and I, you know, my honest expectation is the Fed will continue to squeeze until something breaks. So right now, there's been very little downside to their raising rates other than a market correction of, you know, 15 or 20 percent. And the bonds, of course, have sold off. But there's not a lot of pain yet. And at some point, there will be pain, right? Whether it's domestically or internationally, I don't know. Um, but there will be pain. And at that point, the Fed will have to make a hard decision. And if they decide to continue to reduce the money supply and to raise rates and those sorts of things in order to fight inflation, then the markets are really going to have a hard time with that. And if the Fed eases off so that whatever you know pain that they're experiencing is alleviated and inflation comes roaring back, well, that's going to be a little bit different too. That's how inflation doesn't go away, right? Because we don't we don't muster the will to slay the dragon. When confronted with a problem, we back off and inflation doesn't quite get stamped out. It flares back up again. I think that that decision point is in front of the Fed. I just don't know when it's going to happen or what specifically is going to create that circumstance. Lots of uncertainty, holding lots mm-hmm. of cash. It all makes sense, doesn't it? God, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense to you and me anyway, right? <laughs> Yep, uh, but that's but that you know that's that's kind of why we are where we are uh, in terms of of putting uh, my clients' money to work. Uh, mm-hmm. That's the that's the environment we see, and as we go and we look at individual companies, we have to be mindful of this context, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You can't just say, "Oh, this is a great company, and I really like this price." Okay, well, what's the you know what's the current look like here in the water we're swimming in? That's kind of a weird metaphor, but I, I guess we'll go with it. Yeah. Um, you know, what's what's the context look like? And right now it's tough. And we've, we're so used to, I think people are still getting it sort of beat out of them. It's been Goldilocks for 10 years or 12 years or something. And, you know, little blip during March 2020. And then away we went again. Um, you could buy anything and, and hang on to it for a month and make 20 percent very well yeah yes it will take a lot to beat that out of people won't it <laughs> you know one of the markers i look at is the is kathy wood's arkk fund yep <laughs> um and, and and i don't think i'm the only person doing this i'm not even sure i came up with it on my own i probably read somebody that does it but you can you can look and see how many shares are outstanding right mm-hmm. so even though the 
the fund price is way down. The shares outstanding have continued to climb. So that tells me that that her investors are buying the dip. Yep. And and in my opinion. Uh, the bust of the sort of thing that she invests in, the transformational technology sort of stuff, won't be complete until her clients have given up on her. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that uh, they're still buying the dip tells me this isn't over yet. Yeah. That's, that's one of the markers I look at. Yeah, we have written quite a bit about ARC and, and also meme stocks. People are still crazy for meme stocks, <laughs> which are just, you know. Totally. crazy yeah <laughs> i mean <laughs> yeah, yep and uh, the the funny thing is we actually owned gamestop and sold it prior to it launching into the stratosphere and i, I reflected on that i'm like even if i because because it was it was kind of a you know first i thought it was a value and then their business never quite stabilized right so so we were seeing a lot of cash flow we said okay you know we think that's stable that makes sense to us we'll invest in it well, the, the cash flow is never quite stabilized. And you've got a, a whole lot of bit, you know, uh, product cycle kind of stuff in there in terms of games and, and game machines and that sort of thing. Uh, but I reflected on that. I said, okay, even if I had held on to it into its skyrocket, you know, launch as a meme stock, how long could I have honestly held that? And I concluded I would not have sold anywhere near the top. I'd have bailed far earlier than that because then I said, "Holy cow, this is really over, overpriced now," and, and we'd have we'd have gotten rid of it then, um, and not gotten some of the returns that somebody did uh, as it went into the stratosphere. So that that was really kind of interesting for me to to speculate about. But yeah, we owned GameStop for a while. Yeah, I mean. Those things seem like, I mean, it's almost like people are looking for the absolute worst deteriorating businesses and secular declining industries and treating them like, you know, they, the, the meme stalkers say, we'll never sell. We're never going to sell. Of course, I believe that they will and they will learn a huge lesson. And then, you know, when they're completely gone from the market and when ARCs, you know, can't attract another dollar, then maybe, uh, then maybe it'll be over. Then in my opinion, that's the time to go fishing in the space that Kathy Wood fishes in. Yeah. Right. Until then, I think that's still a hazardous area to look for uh, good investments. Yeah. That's the, the analog for me is 2002 with lots of little tech companies trading at discount to, you know, net cash and net current assets. I, I think you're going to have that opportunity. Yep. Um, I, I look forward to that opportunity. That's, that's the opportunity I want to be set up for. Um, and I, I just don't think it's here yet. I think you're halfway down. You're not down at the bottom of the mountain yet. Yep. All right, Jeff, this has been a lot of fun. It's time for my final question. And the final question is the same for every guest, no matter what the topic is, even if the topic is not finance, it's the exact same question. So the question is, if you could leave our listeners with a single thought today, what would it be? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Don't risk money you can't afford to lose. Mm, I like that. Very good. Straight to the point. All right. right. Um, so, you know, and I'll expand on that a little bit. Yeah. But we, you know, people, we get all wrapped up uh, in my industry talking about stocks or talking about stocks versus bond or active versus passive management and all the trivia of finance that Wall Street has built multiple industries on. But really, at an individual level, where your decision making starts is how much do you make? How much do you spend? Are you saving money? For what purpose? And, and that sort of thing. And those sorts of strategic decisions in your life are going to be much more important than the kind of decisions you'll hear analysts and financial planners talk about in terms of active versus passive, bonds versus stocks, that sort of thing. Right? So, don't put any money at risk that you can't afford to lose. Put your financial house in order and you will be fine no matter what decisions you made over here. All right. That's what I think about. Very good. That's excellent. Um, thank you for being here, Jeff. It was uh, actually, it was a lot of fun to talk with you. <laughs> well, thanks, Dan. I enjoyed it too. Yeah. Um, 
hopefully we do your listeners some good. Oh, yeah. The the simple fact that we are so simpatico, which I, I promised everyone listening, I did not know this about Jeff. I did not know that he and I were so much <laughs> on the same page. So that alone was uh, was really a, a fun aspect of this. Okay. All right. But we're definitely, I enjoyed this a lot. I, I hope we can sort of call you back in, I don't know, six or 12 months or something and, and see what you're saying. Yeah, thinking. sounds good. Yeah. Love to do it again. All right. Well, that's bye-bye for now then. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Dan. Once again, I just want to say this. It really is true. Jeff and I did not get together. We don't know each other. We only just spoke for the first time um, on this podcast in this interview. And I actually, I haven't read Mullenkamp's stuff for years. I didn't read anything until um, just, just before we started the interview. I pulled up their latest quarterly letter just to look through it. Just two pages. It's pretty short. And, um, and even then I couldn't have anticipated that we'd be so much on the same page and thinking so much alike about things, which is refreshing, right? You, you, you develop your view and you stand on, you know, you stand your ground until you have reason to do otherwise, until you have reason to change your mind. But it's really nice to have somebody else agree with you, isn't it? It's nice to be at the table with someone else and not, not alone. Um, so that was fun. Also, um, like I said, you know, I, I sort of made fun of the two of us. I said, we're like fuddy duddies or something. But, you know, being being conservative with money, like there's no there's no substitute for that. There's no substitute for having plenty of cash on hand just in case. None. You know, you can't say, well, I'll just put that cash in my 401k. No, it's not the same. Not anything like it. Um, so, yeah. I really enjoyed that, and I look forward to uh, talking with Jeff again in, in you know, several months from now, maybe a year from now, whatever, whenever we can have him back on. And I hope you do too. All right. That was great. Let's look at the mailbag. Let's do it right now. One of the most successful entrepreneurs in America over the past 50 years is going public with his fourth and final prediction about a scenario he calls America's nightmare winter. Woo. You've probably never heard of Bill Bonner, but in addition to owning an interest in businesses all over the globe, he also owns more than 100,000 acres with massive properties in South America, Central America, and the U.S., plus three large properties in Europe. And I've been to one of them. It's gorgeous, gorgeous chateau. And I've known Bill for many, many years. He hired me into this business. And he says, we're about to enter a very strange period in America, which could result in the most difficult times we've seen in many, many years. And he's made three similar predictions in his 50 plus year career. And each time it proved to be exactly right. Although he was mocked each and every time. And I remember all of them. This is why I strongly encourage you to read about Bonner's fourth and final prediction, totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report that we put together called America's Nightmare Winter. Get the facts yourself. Go to www.nightmarewinterscenario.com to get your free copy of this report. Even if he's only partially right, it'll dramatically affect you and your money. So again, go to www.nightmarewinterscenario for this free report. In the mailbag each week, you and I have an honest conversation about investing or whatever is on your mind. Send questions, comments, and politely worded criticisms to feedback at investorhour.com. I read as many emails as time allows, and I respond to as many as possible. You can also call our listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. Kind of a light, well, I'm getting these light mailbags. I guess you guys must be on vacation. I'll bet the mailbag will pick up after Labor Day. But just two of them this week. The first one, of course, is from our uh, faithful listener and longtime correspondent, Lodovic H. And he had a couple questions. Lodovic, you're still asking me about these Russian bonds. I I just, you know, good luck to you if you want to do that. I, I, I could never do it. I just, I don't have that much guts when it comes to putting money to work. But... 
Ludwig H. has another question. He says, real estate is an interesting method to make money, but it's not covered by your company, Stansberry and MarketWise, so far as I know. And then he suggested some real estate folks to have on the show. So Ludovic, we actually do cover real estate. You're right. We don't cover it as much as we cover stocks, but there is a publication that we talked about very briefly. Uh, I think we just mentioned it in passing, maybe, if at all, last week with Brett Eversaw. It's called True Wealth Real Estate. And they cover actual real estate deals that readers can get involved in. Right, they're not they're not buying real estate stocks. They're they're actually getting into real estate deals. So if you go to StansberryResearch.com and you look around, you'll find something called True Wealth Real Estate. Um, you know, and I realize you're in Europe, so I'm I'm not sure what kind of rules apply to you, but but we do we do cover it a little bit. And I agree. You know, it's kind of, it's one of those things that um, most people could probably do at least as well, if not better at, um, than the stock market. And it's worth knowing something about. Uh, next and last this week is Anthony H. And Anthony, you actually asked um, a question about uh, the Fed and the government. And there were two other questions. And I didn't answer the two other ones because your question speaks to my you know, scant knowledge of how all this works. Um, and you said, Dan, could you expand on the relationship between the Federal Reserve and the government spending leading to inflation? If the money doesn't get lent and spent, I agree, it won't show up as inflation. But if I remember right, during COVID, Powell spoke publicly that Congress needs to act aggressively and assure the Federal Reserve would accommodate the spending. Doesn't the government need the Federal Reserve to accommodate spending? <clears throat> or can the government just print spend and add it to the deficit? Is the Fed balance sheet a part of the deficit? I never totally understand how it works. Appreciate any insight. Fed balance sheet is totally separate. Totally separate entity. It's not even really a government entity, technically speaking. They're, it's run by a government-appointed uh, group of people. So, so that's that answer. We know that one. Um, can the government just print, spend, and add it to the deficit? Well, when the government prints money, they, they do it by selling debt securities. And it just makes it a lot easier to do that if there's this enormous buyer in the market, the Federal Reserve, that can itself print money and just go buy securities with it. And that's what they do. That's the Fed's primary tool. It's really a set of tools, but really their main tool is to print money and buy securities mostly treasury bonds. But, you know, the Bank of Japan playbook had the Bank of Japan buying ETFs and they had mopped up quite a huge segment of the ETF market as we covered when we talked with Brett Eversall last week. So your question is, could you expand on the relationship? I don't even know if I need to expand on it. The Federal Reserve is a huge buyer of treasuries. The government prints money by issuing treasury securities and yeah, it's added to the, if it's not in, if it's not covered by taxes, it is definitely added to the deficit. And they've just completely forgotten about that. They don't, they're not, nobody's concerned about deficit spending at this point. So that's just my understanding of how all this works, right? Government borrows, Fed buys the securities and it, you know, I don't even know if it's accurate. Another, um, listener wrote in and referred to this as monetizing the debt. I'm not even sure it's accurate to refer to it that way, but I don't understand how it's not a de facto monetizing. So what if the Federal Reserve isn't buying direct from the Treasury? So what if the Federal Reserve is only buying from, at this point, I think it's a couple of dozen of these authorized participant type people. Um, I forget what they're called. You know, it's some name like that, authorized participant. And, you know, like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and all these big banks, those are, those are the authorized folks who get to sell treasury securities to the Federal Reserve. And, you know, mostly the money, I think, just sits in the reserve account at the Fed, right? The, the Fed gets the treasury security and the bank gets the cash, but I think mostly the cash just sits in the, in the reserve account at the Fed. And, and therefore, that's why I say, well, you know, mostly doesn't get lent and spent. So that's just my understanding of the mechanics of it. Having said that, like, as I've said before, 
If all you have is the Federal Reserve printing money and buying securities, maybe you don't get higher prices. But I think technically that should be called inflation because they are printing money. So when you get the government printing money, that is, you know, lending it into existence and immediately or, you know, pretty soon after spending it and even just making the plan to spend it at some point in, you know, in the coming year or years, then you get inflation or the effect of inflation that we all recognize as inflation. This is a better topic, Anthony H., than I, I don't do it justice. It's a better topic than this. And I've been trying to get certain people on the show um, to talk about it who I think know a lot about it, but um, no luck so far. <laughs> Maybe I'll get one of them on here. Until then, you know, keep asking questions and I'll keep trying to learn and maybe you and I together will figure something out. All right. Well, that's another mailbag and that's another episode of the Stansbury Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We provide a transcript for every episode. Just go to www.investorhour.com, click on the episode you want, scroll all the way down, click on the word transcript and enjoy. If you like this episode and know anybody else who might like it, tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at investorhour.com. And do me a favor, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at Investor Hour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. You can also just type Stansberry Investor Hour on Twitter. It comes right up. Have a guest you want me to interview? Drop us a note at feedback at investorhour.com or call our listener feedback line 800 381 2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. Till next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to investorhour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email feedback at investorhour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansberry Research, its parent company, or affiliates. You should not treat any opinion expressed on this program as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of opinion. Neither Stansbury Research nor its parent company or affiliates warrant the completeness or accuracy of the information expressed on this program, and it should not be relied upon as such. Stansbury Research, its affiliates and subsidiaries are not under any obligation to update or correct any information provided on the program. The statements and opinions expressed on this program are subject to change without notice. No part of the contributor's compensation from Stansbury Research is related to the specific opinions they express. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Stansbury Research does not guarantee any specific outcome or profit. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this program. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. Investments or strategies mentioned on this program may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as a recommendation that is appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this program. Before acting on information on the program, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor.